Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Inside ETF's weekly webinar, How to Launch and Grow an ETF in 2018, Three Approaches to a Common Problem, the Unanswered Questions. My name is Matt Hogan, and I'm the CEO of Inside ETFs, and I'll be your host for today's webinar. At the recently concluded Inside ETFs conference, one of the most popular sessions we had focused on this question, how to launch and grow an ETF. The session was packed to the gills, and we got dozens of questions from the audience using our Slido app. So many questions that we weren't able to answer even a fraction of them in the time we had on stage, which is what brings us here today. Today, we're going to ask and answer some of those audience questions that we were unable to get to on the day of. Joining me here to answer those questions are two representatives from that session, Edward Baer and Mike Cronin. Ed is the Council for Investment Management Practice at Ropes & Gray. His practice focuses on advising ETF, open and closed-end investment companies, and their independent director and trustees. And he has deep experience in operational, governance, compliance, regulatory, and business issues related to ETFs and other investment companies and asset managers. Mike Cronin is the President of Marketing Services for Exchange Traded Concepts. Mr. Cronin joined ETC from Station Hill Growth Consulting, where he was president. Robo Global, the robotics ETF, Robo, grew from $130 million in AUM to over $1 billion in AUM in six months. Prior to launching SHGC, Mr. Cronin headed up ETF data and education sales and marketing for ETF.com, uh, my parent company, starting with Index Universe. Real joy to have both of these uh, folks on the panel today. And I can't wait to ask them questions, but I am going to have to wait a little bit because before I get to them, I want to bring in Ken Purnell. Ken is the head of asset-backed portfolio management at Invesco and fixed-income senior portfolio manager at PowerShares by Invesco. Each week, we like to showcase one fund that we think investors may want to know about. And this week, we brought Ken on to talk about the PowerShares Variable Rate Investment Grade Portfolio, or VRIG. We're going to give Ken five minutes to discuss VRIG and tell us what it's about, why it matters, and how it can help your portfolio. And then we're going to bring in Ed and Mike for our discussion on answering your questions about how to launch and grow an ETF in 2018. But for now, Ken, it's over to you. Thanks a lot, Matt. Appreciate the opportunity to talk about uh, the PowerShares Variable Rate Investment Grade ETF, or as you referred to it and as we call it, VRIG. I'm the lead portfolio manager on the fund, working with over four portfolio managers from, from the Invesco Structured Fixed Income Group. It's a team that's responsible for managing over $40 billion in assets and fixed income. Overall, Invesco Fixed Income manages over $300 billion in assets. In regard to VRIG, PowerShares launched VRIG September of 2016. That was 16 months ago. In this brief amount of time, the, the fund's AUM has seen strong growth. We're currently at $268 million today. Um, sector allocations of VRIG can be seen on the slide, too, that you, that you have in front of you. Um, the idea for the fund was to create an actively managed floating rate ETF that's a bit different from the ones that already existed in the market. We saw in the market uh, on the high grade end of the scale floating rate funds that were uh, generally concentrated, highly concentrated in corporate bonds, mostly banks, and with yields that uh, were well below the annual inflation rate. Uh, the, on the other end of the credit spectrum, it's well represented with bank loan funds um, and they offer decent yields, but below investment grade credit quality. So VRIG is designed to be somewhere in the middle in terms of yield, but with a high grade credit quality and a diversified mix of mostly floating rate bonds. The goals for VRIG and the way we manage the fund to, is to achieve these goals, and that is to generate a yield that's significantly above that of the passive floating rate investment grade ETFs, notably FLOT and FLRN. Currently, the distribution yield for VRIG is 2.33% uh, versus 1.71 for uh, float, which FLOT, which you can see we're meeting objective number one. Maintain, maintaining a solid investment grade credit quality is our second goal, and currently VRIG has been very steady at an A1, A plus overall credit quality, utilizing a diversified mix of uh, fixed income sectors. 
Uh, we main, we endeavor to keep the duration very short. We do that. It's currently uh, a duration of 0.4, and we try to minimize the NAV volatility. On slide four, or slide four, uh, not the same one you guys have, but the one that's up there now. We want to show that the market conditions are right for VRIG. Um, the Fed is raising rates, and in fact, we're expecting that uh, next month they'll raise them by 25 basis points again. That'll be their sixth rate hike since December of 2015. The Fed's dot plots, or their median projections, are calling for three rate hikes this year. As Fed funds and LIBOR rates rise, coupons on VRIG underlying bonds also rise, but with a very short duration there's very little price impact on the bonds, which basically is why you want to own floaters when rates are rising. Another um, condition that's ripe for VRIG currently is that credit fundamentals in the high-grade bond space are very good. And uh, finally, the yield curve has flattened considerably since the rate normalization started. Uh, an example can be seen with, with the iShares Passive Fund, uh, AGG, its net indicated yield is only 38 basis points higher than VRIG, but its duration is 15 times longer, much more rate risk, in other words. Uh, normally, the yield give up is considerably more to avoid rate risk than what you have now due to the flattening in the curve. On the next slide, you can see where VRIG compares in terms of yield and duration. You can see that VRIG's yield is above other high-grade similar duration funds and also close to that of the ag. On the next slide, these conditions of rising rates and tightening spreads persisted throughout 2017 and resulted in excellent returns for VRIG. Um, Morningstar has VRIG rated uh, top 3% in the ultra short category uh, last year, and with a 3.24% uh, rate of return, that exceeded the average for the category of 1.44% by a comfortable margin. To summarize, the market conditions call for something that benefits from rising rates, which VRIG does. Economic growth provides a firm underpinning for bond spreads, which also helps VRIG. A flatter yield curve means you can cut your rate risk or duration without sacrificing a lot of yield. VRIG offers a low volatility alternative in a period of expensive stocks and low bond yields. So thank you very much for your time today, and I would appreciate it if you please take a moment to look at VRIG to see how it may fit in your clients' portfolios. Thank you, Matt. Thanks so much, Kit. Yeah, no, thank you so much. Perfect. A perfect example of the kind of funds we try to showcase here, uh, interesting new products that do interesting new things for investor portfolios, particularly timely uh, given what's going on with the market. I do want to bring in uh, Ed Barron and Mike Cronin here. Uh, as a reminder, Ed is Counsel for Investment Management Practice at Ropes & Gray, and Mike is President of Marketing Services for Exchange Traded Concepts. Uh, let's dig right in, gentlemen. We have a lot of questions from the original conference audience that we didn't have time to answer at our session. I'd also say that the webinar audience can ask questions uh, using the Q&A toggle on your webinar viewing browser, so feel free to enter those in. We'll jump back and forth between the questions coming in from the audience and the questions we had on the day of. My first question uh, for you, Ed, Ed is uh, what are the startup costs for the different paths to take when launching an ETF? Okay, uh, thanks, Matt. Um, and just as a reminder, especially for folks that weren't at the original panel, the, the, the couple of different paths we discussed um, – it was sort of the traditional path, which is a, a sponsor gets into the business by setting up a, you know, setting, getting an exemptive application, setting up a fund, hiring a capital markets person, sort of building out a big, you know, a big team, um, doing all the things that it probably does for its mutual fund business already, and sort of replicating that, you know, hiring a CCO, all of that. Um, there's other uh, alternatives to get into the to the space, and the other panelists talked about those. Um, you know, basically white labeling, where where you um, go to a, go to a firm like uh, ETF managers or something, and and use you know, work with them to set up a, a a particular fund where they provide some of the infrastructure that's needed to to operate the fund. And um, and you know, there's other services similar to to that, and so you can do the sort of the big 
a big jump in with with all of the resources and all of the requirements there, or something that's that's where you know you're relying on an infrastructure provided by a, another party. Um, the the relative costs, as you can imagine, differ greatly. Um, it's much less expensive if you're not building out the infrastructure, not hiring all of the people, um, not you know not engaging with um, with all of the sort of the big traditional service providers and, and sort of negotiating your own contracts. So, um, the, you know, it be, could be quite expensive to get into the business from the sort of the full on both feet in. But that's the approach that's been taken by a lot of large traditional asset managers. A lot of the ETF startups, uh, startup firms where they're sort of in the ETF business and ETF business only have partnered with some of those firms and I think the cost could be significantly less. I don't have a sort of sort of a specific dollar number, but I think on the panel Matt, um someone mentioned about, you know, two hundred and fifty thousand to start up a, a a firm, you know, in a sort of a smaller uh, uh you know, smaller complex or white label pro- uh, product. And uh, that's a you know represents a much earlier break even point than a traditional startup where you're hiring 20 people and uh, you know setting up your own board and things like that. Hey, sorry about that. Mike, does those, do those numbers make sense to you? Are those the approximate cost of working with a firm like yours? Um, it's a little on the low end. Um, I'm not really on the um, on, on that part of the business. I, I focus more on the marketing side. But if um, someone was to come to ETC and talk to Jay Baker um, you know, or, or Garrett Stevens, they could give them uh, appropriate costs. But um, that's that's not something I, I could talk to right now. I just I, I just don't have that background. Um, on okay. the marketing side, we definitely um, encourage people from a best practice standpoint to spend um, three hundred thousand dollars per year on marketing alone. Uh, now a lot of people sort of balk at that number. Um, and again, it's best practices. Some people like to spend less. Um, but that that is um, just on the marketing alone. What I, what you know, sort of my recommendation to people. All right, I definitely want to get into that marketing number and talk about how that three hundred thousand dollars should be apportioned. Uh, but one more question on cost. This was uh, from the audience. Just want to get this out of the way. Um, and I guess for for you, Ed. Uh, what are the annual carrying costs involved in an ETF? Not a number, but what are the what are the costs that people have to pay? And also, do you see more people coming into the ETF space than before, or are people being scared off by the costs and by the increasing barriers to entry? What's your feel for the market? Um, yeah, sure. So, so I'll take the second part first. Um, the ETF rule that is, in theory, going to be proposed this year um, is – designed in part, I think, to lower those barriers to entry, because uh, traditionally you have to get an exemptive application. It, it In prior years used to take, you know, 18 months or, or so sometimes to, to get an exemption. That uh, time frame has compressed. It's probably down to four to six months at this point, because they've become, become pretty cookie cutter at this point. Um, so it, 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 the, the barriers to entry have been reduced, but the costs are still there. Um, you know, mute, um, ETFs, are like mutual funds, so they have annual registration statement filings. You have typically four four board meetings a year, and usually some of those, are at least uh, at least one of them, but more likely two or three, are in person. So you have to fly in your directors and and your your management personnel to a, the, the common location. So there's there's costs there. You have to pay the registration fees for for uh, you know the sales you you uh, make during the year. Um, lots of different sort of ongoing things like that. Um, so, so the startup costs, you know, is a is a big slug at the outset, um, and then the the ongoing costs are you know are pretty consistent from year after year. Now, hopefully, your your fund is growing and you're taking in more revenue and you're able to build out your teams and and spend more in marketing and things like that. That makes sense. Let's talk a little bit about that marketing spend. Uh, Mike, we did have a question, uh, one of the more popular questions. How do ETF assets grow if there isn't buzz around a product or its name? Uh, What's the strategy, retail or institutional? How do you get a product off the ground uh, when it's not sort of an instant hit the way a couple uh, occasional ETFs are? 
Well, that's a great question. Um, what I'd like to, to focus on is trying to get the momentum started. Um, and so what I'll do is in tandem, I'll do a, a strong PR push uh, with a, a webinar or, or multiple webinars to get people talking about the product um, and to get the information out there as far as why the investment case is compelling and why people should consider it and then where it should fit in the portfolio uh, to kind of take the the uh, suggestions to the next level. So that's well, the first thing I do is just really try to get momentum started. Um, and, and a lot of times clients have come to me in the past when their products have been stuck. You know, they'll get stuck at an asset level. And so, you know, then is it's all about creating that momentum to get the, um, the creates flowing and then building upon that momentum to really uh, start, you know, building assets in a meaningful way. What about you from your perspective, Ed? You must see a lot of companies come across your path. Uh, can you tell from the outset which ones are going to be successful and which ones are not, or, um, or, or, or is that impossible for you to, to guess that before the products come to market? Yeah, I mean, so the, 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 I think people have, have sort of two issues. They, they either um, – the ones that, that don't automatically, uh, you know, have success – there's two sort of things they have to uh, to work on. One of them is is you have to have a good idea for your product, and so in some ways that's the easy part. Um, obviously, it's a crowded space and getting more crowded every day, but you do have to have a good idea for your product. And so, if you have a good idea, at least you have you have sort of hope. Um, the the second part, though, is is the part that's that's hard, which is how do you get distribution? How do you get people to to sell? And so, obviously, that's where the marketing folks come in. Obviously, an interesting idea with an interesting ticker helps. Um, there's some, you know, some specific ones that were mentioned at the conference that are just, you know, just got buzz because of the name of the name of the fund or the ticker um, or the theme that they were were headed towards. So those are the two things that you have to have to do. And unfortunately, the the second half costs tends to cost a lot of money. You have to you have to hire the right people, people who have good relationships with. The distribution firms that understand that ETF distribution is different than mutual fund distribution, things like that. So it's just it, you know it, it's it's often a, a, a question of staying in it for for long enough to actually get the traction, get the distribution, and um, and you know, hopefully your good idea can uh, can be out there and be sold. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, Mike, I want to ask point. you about. Yep, I, w- I wanted to follow up and ask you about one of those good ideas. Um, uh, that you've been involved with recently, which is the the blockchain ETF coin. I guess you walk me through the example of how that turns into a, a, an overnight success. What's the what's the hard work that turns that into an overnight success? Well, I think that you know to kind of um, you know sort of add on to what Ed was saying is um, you have to create a story, right? You have to have um, a good story about why it's unique, why it's uh, well positioned, uh, especially in a competitive space where you know four products came out around, along the similar the- theme, you know within a three week period. So, you know, making sure that people understand your story, and then having the content to back that up with either white papers, investment cases, um, you know, good webinars or good video that are on your website that really explain. Um, and then even you know doing things like a product spotlight or a company spotlight to then shine a spotlight on the holdings within the fund uh, to get to allow people to get further educated and then how to differentiate your product among the competitors um, you know based on you know the research and the index uh, that's been created. And then the other the other part of that is on the distribution, right? So it's getting the distribution right. Initially, what we recommend yeah. is we focus on the RIA channel, uh, and then we go to the uh, allocators, the, the advisors, the wirehouses, the large independent broker dealers, and then and then sometimes to the and then to the institutions as the assets build. Yeah, and that, that actually dovetails nicely into the next audience question, which was. Uh, actually, for you, Mike, what your thoughts are on wholesaling into the independent RIA marketplace? Is is that possible, advisable? How do you succeed with that? Yeah, I think that's the key to a lot of the success uh, that we've seen initially is 
uh, using the different media channels that have a strong relationship with them, whether it's RA channel or ETF Trends or ETF.com, um, to to reach those uh, independent RIAs uh, that are on the the larger uh, platforms that do allow um, the startups, to, you know, on their platform from day one. Um, and so, you know, reaching them, getting them to opt in to follow you. Send out, we send out drip campaigns on a weekly basis, um, taking the investment case and kind of breaking it up and doing these company spotlights uh, to them so that we're continually educating them on why this is a good theme and then why our, our holdings and the index that we created, um, you know, are sort of a, a better, you know, what we think is, is, a, is a better mousetrap. Fair enough. I want to get into some questions that the audience asked about differentiating your service provider. This is a, a very general question, Ed, but I have a follow-up. The audience asked, how important is strong legal representation in this industry, uh -huh. uh, for which you're, you're, you're going to say very important? But I guess uh -huh. more to that, how, how does someone choose between you know the various law firms? What, what are actually the advantages and disadvantages and and features that they should be weighing. Sure. So so you're right. I will say it's important. Um, uh, part of the reason it's important is the way that <laughs> ETFs have developed. Um, the, the, you get an exemption, a series of exemptions from the SEC to operate an ETF. And so it's really important to, to, to understand how those exemptions work within the, the legal framework and, um, and to make sure you comply with those exemptions. So there's a lot of technical details about things you have to do, things you can and can't do. So it is important, obviously. Um, in terms of choosing from law firms, I mean, you know, I'll I, I'll put in a plug for myself. I I was uh, you know around the legal team for iShares for five years, so I, uh, I I know both the inside stuff and the and the legal stuff as well. So so um, you know that's one thing that I would think about. I mean, the exemptions are these things that that all the lawyers that work in this ETF space can interpret because they say what they say, and and there's sort of lore that's developed, and and everyone who's in the space will will know that. Um, the actual sort of how ETFs operate is a, is a harder nut to crack, and I think fewer lawyers know that. So when you can find one who does, that's a good thing. Yeah, yeah. So how does that pay off? Like, give me an example. Does it pay off in in better relationships with APs? Does it pay off in better interpretations of the exemptive relief? Or, or how does that insider knowledge end up benefiting the client? Yeah, so um, you know, ultimately, uh, you know, my hope is that uh, it'll it'll help my clients in the long term because they'll be in a better position to take advantage of, of regulatory changes when the ETF rule, you know, if it does come out and 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 does have uh, mm -hmm. you know some benefits for for the industry. Um, hopefully, that will be something that that I can help my clients take advantage of. But it, it comes out, you know, in real world questions. You know, the the, the exemption says this. Does that mean I can't do these five things that every other, you know, the, the, the old ETF sponsors like iShares and State Street and Vanguard can do because they have different relief from, from you know, a longer time ago? Right. Um, so, you know, helping them navigate some things like that that are sort of structural differences between ETFs. And then just practical questions. Um, we had, a, you know, I had a client that, that called and said, you know, I noticed this ETF that I own had, uh, you know, 10 times its normal average dairy, daily volume on Friday. Is that possible? Or am I just reading something wrong? And, you know, and, you know, I can actually explain, okay, well, there was obviously crazy volatility on Friday and um, and there was all these options that were exercised and, you know, you can figure out how to get there. And so that that's something that I think that a lot of, you know, a lot of uh, practitioners don't necessarily sort of appreciate the ecosystem around ETFs with options, markets, and other things that, uh, you know, if they're sort of stuck with dealing with the, uh, the exemptive application for the most part. That's a great answer. Mike, I'm going to throw that over to you. There are multiple white label service providers out there. I guess how should a client differentiate between those and make the choice for which one's the best to work with? Yeah, I think that from uh, exchange traded concepts perspective, we, we like to um, tell people to make sure that they look at the, uh, the fund boards. So we have three different fund boards uh, set up uh, with uh, different administrators, custodians, um, and, and other support personnel um, around compliance. And we basically, you come in to uh, talk to us and basically the, the three different uh, funds basically bid for your business and you get to pick which fund you want to be in. 
Um, and each fund has a very strong fund board, uh, independent. You know, it's not it's not someone that um, you know the the having a weak fund board, having worked for Board IQ on the mutual fund side, I can say you know without a fact is such an important part of running a fund. And so one of the things that I really liked about ETC when I decided to join with them is that they had such a strong independent fund board, um, and that I think is is you know one of the the real differentiators between the the, the different um, you know white label service providers, and that's something that you know I think is why you know ETC leads in, in assets uh, among all of the uh, white label providers. Okay, interesting. Uh, good comments. Couple time for a couple more questions. Uh, this one uh, I'll throw out there uh, came in from the audience at the conference. What are your thoughts on letting an index incubate for proof of concept? versus launching a new ETF that may go for a while with low assets. Uh, Ed, what would you say about that? Well, yeah, I mean, obviously, if you have a proven concept, it probably makes it easier to market and, and um, probably makes it easier to uh, to actually operate because you've got experience, um, you know, in doing the rebalances, doing the, the reconstitutions and things like that. But I don't think a lot of folks have the luxury of that time, especially if they're an ETF startup. So, uh, you know, an established asset manager who's got a got a business and got revenue can probably do something like that. I just think it's harder for for a startup to uh, to incubate and not be earning anything. And so, the temptation I think is is there to to come up with the idea and launch it and sort of learn how it works in real time. Yep. So that may line up with you, Mike, as well. Yes, uh, I definitely agree. I mean, with um, when I when I meet a, a new new product for the first time and I know they have an index that's been around for a year or three years. I know that they they know the the universe very well. They've done the research and that um you know there's not gonna be uh you know there's not gonna be a lot of surprises around rebalance. So it's it's just a, a better comfort uh with someone who has that experience. Okay, great. Another question from the audience on the webinar. How successful have ETFs been in getting traction in institutional channels with consultants, public and corporate pension funds, endowments and foundations? And is that an area that new funds should look at? Um, Ed, I'll let you take a swing at that first. Sure. So there's um, there's obviously some, um, you know, some products that are, are geared towards those. So um, I think you've probably heard about some, uh, some products that are in the sort of the impact investing space where um, I think a natural audience for them is things like foundations and endowments and, and others that are sort of typically um, oriented towards sort of socially responsible or, or, or uh, you know, impact investing. And so I think those products can, can and should take advantage of, of channels like that. Um, you know, a lot of, uh, I think a lot of, uh, you know, consultants and, and RIAs will invest in the hot ideas. And, and so obviously if you have one of those ideas, you know, cybersecurity or weed or something like that, that's, you know, thematically very sort of hot and, and lots of uh, market interest. I think that's another thing that you can do as well. So it sort of depends on your product. It's hard for a for a startup manager, I think, to, to, to cover all those bases. So they should focus on the ones that are sort of their natural constituency, I think. Mike, any uh, anything to add there? I think with uh, most of the startups, we uh, we advise them to go after RIAs first, uh, then the financial advisor market, and then uh, institutions. Um, but Ed's right; it depends on on what the product is. Um, I think that you know, with the ESG products, SRI products, you can you can go to institutions first. It, it really also depends on seeding. You know, if you have 50 million, 100 million in seeding. You know, you can you can be positioned to get a five or ten million dollar ticket from an institution, but if you only have two and a half million in seeding, an institution you know may have may not be able to do a ticket under a million dollars. Right, makes sense. All right, Ed, you get the last question. This is a great one. Uh, if you incubate a strategy, how much of that track record can be utilized when marketing the ETF? If that's an SMA incubation, an index, a back test, what can you and can you not do? Yeah, so um, so if you're actually managing money, so real money, and and have a track record, 
um, you might be able to include it in your prospectus, not as the fund's performance, but as, as uh, you know, prior performance of the manager. So that's if you're really running money. If you're, if you're just going, relying on a back test, um, there's been some, some FINRA activity over the years. Um, you're allowed to include back-tested index information with, uh, ex, uh, with appropriate disclosures in sort of one-on-one -on -one institutional presentations, but you typically would not include it in marketing materials that you're uh, making publicly available. So, so, uh, and it's also really important to have the disclosures indicating that it's you know hypothetical performance, back-tested data might not re represent real results, blah blah blah. Absolutely. That sounds about right. Well, that takes up our full half hour. I want to thank you guys uh, for joining us today. Ed Bear is counsel for the investment management practice at Ropes and Gray. Mike Cronin is president of marketing services for exchange traded concepts. And earlier we heard from Ken Purnell, who's fixed income senior portfolio manager at PowerShares by Invesco, talking about VRIG, the PowerShares variable rate investment grade portfolio. Thanks to everyone for joining us on this week's webinar. We will be back next week with a different topic, three ways to protect your portfolio from the next pullback. Certainly a timely and interesting session. Thanks for joining this webinar. Follow up with our speakers if you want to learn more. And we'll see you all again here next week. Thanks so much.